to the Succeed Like a Zebra webinar series. I am super excited to have you on with us today. Uh, for those of you who are new to me, I am Nick Zizi. I'm a two-time best-selling author, student success coach, and a student leadership speaker where I travel across the nation and I speak at schools and conferences about student success and student leadership. As a matter of fact, I have a best-selling book, uh, which is Succeed Like the Zebra, the college guide uh, to success. And, and, and tonight we're going to be talking about a lot of the elements from the book, but from a different perspective. And before I bring to the front our guests, I, I do want to let you know that uh, this is a series, a webinar series. So we've had uh, a lot of guests uh, this past I would say the past three weeks now, we've had several guests come on and we have a lot more guests coming on after this. So if you'd like to stay connected, if you'd like to get more information about the webinars and the topics that we're going to cover, uh, please do stay connected. Uh, make sure you let us know and just follow us on social media at Nick Zizi on Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. So at Nick Zizi for more information. All right, so let's dive right into it. I know you signed in, you, you registered for this webinar so that you can learn more information about college, the college admissions process. Now, before I even get into that, I want to uh, tell you a little bit about my guest. Uh, first and foremost, my guest is someone I've known for a very long time, a very long time, and I am so excited to have her with us here. Uh, she's, in fact, a part of Team Zebra. Uh, if you have purchased this book, you'll probably I'm sure you've probably seen her name and also in the uh, in the back the acknowledgments where I thank everyone who contributed and who have helped out she was one of our main contributors and we thank her for all that she's done and all that she's doing and I'm looking forward to seeing more uh, from her uh, and, and what she's doing so let's dive in now our guest tonight is Gertiana Telemar uh, she is the assistant director of undergraduate admission and University of Miami. Now, she's a first-generation Haitian-American higher education professional with over eight years of experience in student affairs, admissions, and counseling. She graduated from the University of Miami with a Bachelor's of Science in Education and Visual uh, Journalism with a minor in African, oops, let me go back, Africana Studies. Did I get that right? Africana studies. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Africana studies. There we go. There we go. All right. I, I just got these new lips. So some of the words oh. aren't coming out <laughs> properly. So, <laughs> all right. So later she earned her master's in education through the International Educational uh, Development Program at the University of Pennsylvania, where she focused on the educational migration patterns of Caribbean youth diaspora engagement and the phenomenon most commonly known as brain drain. So I, I'm really excited to have her with us today. Uh, she, she also has other passion areas uh, that include such as youth leadership and development, civic engagement, educational access, and higher education policy work. So welcome, welcome to Thank the webinar you. series, Gertiana. We're so happy that you're here with us. How are you? Thank you. I'm doing well. Thank you for inviting me. I am honored to be on this webinar series. So thank you for having me. That's awesome. So we're happy that you're here with us. And I want to pause quickly to let everyone know, um, if you have any questions, please uh, post your questions in the Q&A. Uh, right there on the bottom there, you'll see a little icon there, Q&A. Just click on it and you can post your questions. And when we get to that section, Tonight, we'll answer your questions. So whatever questions you have about the admissions process, the college admission process, please do post your questions there. All right, so let's dive into it. You know, there are a lot of students who, who want to go uh, to college, right? Uh, many want to get into the, the top tier schools, and uh, many don't make it. They just, they're not accepted. So uh, first, my first question is, why is it important for people to go to college in the first place? Great question to start off the um, series or webinar. Um, I think college or just attaining higher education is necessary in this day and age, um, whatever that form may look like for you. 
Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be college, but college is the most traditional route of attaining um, some level of higher education after high school. Um, as we all see in this current economy, in this current uh, society that we live in, you do need some form of um, higher education. Um, so whether that is college or something else, um, it's extremely important. For me, college has always been important because that has been drilled into me growing up um, in a young, in, as a young Haitian American, growing up in a Haitian American household, getting higher education was something that was always instilled in me. Um, but I think the most important reason why going to college um, is something that students should be thinking about is a way to advance themselves. Um, regardless of what their dreams are for the future, um, college should definitely be one of their options to consider after high school. Well, that's awesome. That, that, that is incredible. And I think, as you said, it, it's, a, it's one of the options I think most students, if not all students, should consider. So, so with that, um, now, Tell us about the admissions, the, the admission process. Like how, what, what's the first step, second step, third step, and all the way to the point where I'm accepted or not? Okay, so um, the first part of the college admission process actually happens before you even get to senior year. Um, a lot mm -hmm. of students that I meet, um, you know, out when I'm recruiting don't realize that. Um, and then there are students who I meet who actually knew that since they were like in elementary school. Um, the college admission process definitely takes place before senior year. Um, one of the biggest things that students need to do is their research. Um, research is key um, when it comes to starting the college admission process. Um, there are a few questions that you want to, well actually there are multiple questions that you want to ask yourself um, as a student, as a parent, um, when you begin thinking about college, because that's going to inform how you decide to, um, well, actually, which schools you're looking at. Um, it's going to inform how 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 high you should aim on these um, tests as far as the ACT, SAT. It's going to inform how hard you need to work while you are in, in high school. Um, so I would say. As soon as you get to high school, ninth grade, that's when the college admission process works. Um, you want to start doing your research as far as what, what are things that you want in a college for yourself um, before you even start looking at, um, you know, what kind of GPA you need, what kind of test scores you need. You want to know what college you want to go to, or at least have some options about the schools that you're interested in applying to when the time comes so that you are building that, um, your rapport for that school during your high school journey. So I think one of the, some of the important things or questions to ask yourself is, do you wanna stay close to home or do you wanna go far away? Um, the location of the school is important. So that's something you need to research. Um, you also wanna kind of think of what type of institution you wanna to go to. Um, there are plenty of different types of institutions. Um, there are students that I've met um, while I've been recruiting out on the road that don't even know that there are other options for them. Um, there are community colleges, there are four-year institutions, there are private institutions, public institutions, there are Ivy Leagues, um, mm -hmm. there are state colleges, um, there's also HBCUs, um, there's Hispanic serving institutions. So you definitely wanna do your research on the type of atmosphere that you want and the type of things that you kind of need to foster or to, um, be the incubator for your growth in education, um, even before you start looking at some other things. Um, so in addition to looking at the types of institution and location, um, you also want to look at the programs that these schools offer. Um, that's mm -hmm. important part of the admission process as well. Um, you don't want to apply to a school that doesn't have the major that you're interested in. Um, you also want to do that so that you can see what kind of GPA these schools are looking for, these programs are looking for. They, they also may have certain testing requirements um, that not all programs are looking for. So you want to make sure that whatever school you're applying to or schools that you're interested in, um, you know exactly what those guidelines that they're looking for are. Um, and then there's also like student life. Do you want to go to a huge campus where you feel like you're just lost in a crowd? Or some people like that. 
um, or do you want to go to a smaller uh, university or college where you know professors actually know you by name um, or do you want to go to a college where the professor doesn't know your name and you're just in the audience and you're there to get your work done and that's it um, those are things you want to consider as well student life what kind of organizations do they offer um, do they have Greek life is that something you're interested in pursuing um, if you're interested in sports, do they have those programs that you're looking for? Maybe you play sports in high school and you wanna continue that in college. You apply to a school, you get in, and turns out they don't even have that um, sport that you wanted to continue uh, with once you get there. Um, and then finally, career prep. You Well, not finally, there's a few other things, um, but another thing is career prep. Mm -hmm. You wanna kind of do your research to see what, how these schools are preparing students to once they leave, once they graduate, um, that's highly important. You wanna see if they have career centers, um, what are their numbers, how many of their students actually find a job after graduation, how many of their students go on internships, what are the internship opportunities available? Do they have research opportunities for students um, while they're at the school? Um, so those are some of the things that you wanna consider as well before senior year so that while you're navigating high school, um, you make sure that you're on track and checking those boxes so that when you do apply, you know that you have all your things in order. Um, and then finally, the last thing I'll mention, um, I know we're talking a lot, so you might have some other questions, um, is- no, uh, this, this is good, this is good. <laughs> is cost, that's a huge thing. You wanna know how much these universities and colleges cost. Um, whether you know that for a fact you're gonna get a scholarship or financial aid, you do wanna make sure you do your research as far as the cost of these institutions. Um, and things that go into that, not only knowing what the cost is, but do they offer scholarships? Do they offer merit-based aid? Um, that's solely based on your academics. What is that process like? Um, how, like what kind of GPA, what kind of test scores, what kind of extracurricular activities do you need to be con even considered for those merit scholarships. Um, that, that's actually very important and that's something you need to be thinking about, again, before senior year. Um, you also wanna find out what the financial aid need-based side looks like. Um, do they offer need-based aid? Some schools, some institutions um, give students 100% meet 100% need. Um, so whatever your family can't cover, they'll meet 100% of that. Um, and so you really want to do your research to see what schools do those types of things, um, if that's what you're looking for. Um, oftentimes, students kind of have a, an idea of a school that they want to go to just because that's where everyone has gone. That's what everyone has, you know, traditionally um, attended. Um, but there are plenty of institutions out there that offer a variety of things and that cater really to what you're looking for. So it's not just about how you can best present yourself to the school, but it's also finding the right fit in all sense, in all senses, not just um, with the program, but also you can find in a school that'll fully fund you if that's possible. Um, and it is out there, that, that option is out there. Um, it's just all about research. So that's the first part of the admission process that a lot of students don't really think about until they get that email or meet with their counselor and find out that they have to graduate soon. <laughs> so um, it's really important that even in your freshman year of high school, um, you, you start thinking about that. You re should really get serious your junior year, like right before your junior year begins. Um, but if you start early, um, that's, that's better. So would you, would you ever say, uh, like for middle schoolers to start thinking early about that? Or is that too early? I mean, it's never too early. But I mean, if, if they want to start thinking about where they want to go, I think that, mm -hmm. that that's beneficial. For me personally, um, I got introduced to University of Miami because I went to a musician summer camp um, in, I believe, eighth or ninth grade. Um, so that was pretty early, but being exposed to that atmosphere, I was like, oh, college, yeah, like, I like this, this place. Um, and just kind of from there, researching, re um, doing my research to see what opportunities were available for students kind of really ignited that 
passion for me and UM was my top choice when I was um, in high school. Um, so it's never too early to start looking at um, colleges and institutions that you might want to attend, um, but you definitely want to get serious when like that summer of junior year. That's awesome. That, that's really, really good. Now, what if um, a student is in, at a school where their guidance counselor isn't really helping them much? I mean, what other resources do they have uh, that they can tap into to get more information as to finding the right college, finding uh, what they offer at the college and so on and so forth? That's a great question. Um, and, you know, Nationally, that is an issue where students are, where counselors, there's not enough counselors um, to assist all of the students in the school. And so some students are left to kind of fend for themselves. Um, and so, but there are other options for them to learn about these um, institutions. So one is people like me, admission officers. Um, that's one thing that I didn't even know when I was in high school. And a lot of students that I meet out on the road don't even know that until I come to their school and I'm like, I work in admissions and I'm here to answer your questions about the university. Um, so you can definitely reach out to admission counselors, admission officers, um, folks who work in the admission office at these institutions that you're interested in. Um, it's part of our job to kind of help students and counsel them on the admission process. So um, I get a lot of students who email me all the time um, even like freshmen, mainly like juniors and seniors, but I get some students, um, younger students who just reach out and, and kind of introduce themselves and have a list of questions that they just want to ask. Um, and so that's one way to kind of learn about um, the institutions that you're interested in and the admission process. If your counselor at your high school isn't available, you can always send an email call um, or even visit these places to find out um, more information. There's also various websites. Uh, the internet um, is key. Um, you can definitely go to the websites of these universities and colleges to find out more information, um, especially now um, where a lot of things are going virtual. A lot of institutions are putting um, more effort into creating virtual spaces for students to learn more about their institutions. So I know, for example, at UM, we have live information sessions um, where students can just sign up for a day and someone, something like this, we just talk with families about what the university offers, um, the admission process, how to apply, um, and answer any questions that they have. Um, so those are some options that students have as far as um, if their high school counselor isn't available. So they can check with the university's admission officers, you said? Yes, definitely. You can just go to the schools, go to the admission office, and, and ask to speak to the admission officer of the day, um, ask to sign up for a live or for an information session, do a campus tour. Um, we are resources for students. Um, I think, especially in a lot of underserved um, schools, students are, aren't aware of of these resources, um, it's kind of a daunting uh, notion to think that they can even speak to the person who's going to be reading their application, um, but they can. And uh, a lot of students who had um, resources available to them before coming to high school have already known this. And so freshman year, they're already reaching out to their account to their admission officers at the schools they're interested in just to kind of introduce themselves, put their names out there so that they can remember them. So when the time comes, they're like, oh yeah, this student, we've been talking since they were a freshman. Um, a lot of underserved students in underserved populations don't know that they can do that. So that's a huge um, resource that they have accessible to them. So would you say that connecting with the admissions officer, right? early on and staying connected by reaching out via email, phone calls, and also going there in person, would that give you a leg up in a sense? Do you think, does that have anything to do with the, the acceptance part of it, being accepted into the university? So some schools do track demonstrated interest. Um, okay. And so that basically means they track to see how 
often you've visited campus, how often you have been in contact with the admission office. Did you participate in some sort of high school program at the institution? Um, those are things that some institutions do track. Not all institutions track demonstrated interest, um, and they may track it at different parts of the process. Um, so they may not track it during um, the initial admission process, but maybe if the student gets waitlisted, then at that point they'll track it. Um, so it, that's all part of the research and asking questions. Um, you can ask admission um, offices, do they track demonstrated interest? Um, that is information that they'll give to you. They'll let you know, yes, like we will um, track to see how often you have been in touch with us. Um, now, don't go crazy and, you know, email your admission officer every week <laughs> because they will also remember that too. Um, <laughs> but you do want to... Um, do your research and find out if that's something that's part of the process. Um, at UM, we don't um, fully track demonstrated interest um, throughout the entire process, um, but during, like if a student gets waitlisted, that is something that we will take into consideration um, at that time. Well, that's great. That, that is really good. So now with, with the, let, let's talk about SATs, uh, SAT scores, ACT, what role does that even play in, in the college admissions process? Good question. Um, so it depends. Um, some institutions actually are moving towards becoming test optional. So mm -hmm. that means you actually don't even need um, those scores when you are applying. They won't even look at them. Um, some right. institutions, they may request those official test scores if you get admitted, then at that point they'll ask you to submit them. Some institutions self-report, so you don't need to send in your scores yet. You can just kind of tell them what you got, but you don't need to submit the official documents yet. Um, some schools super score. Um, so this is why I say it depends. And that's, again, I'm going to keep saying do your research because each institution is different. So at UM, we super score when it comes to SAT and ACT. So that means um, you can take those exams multiple times, as many times as you'd like. Um, and we will take the highest scores from each subsection and create a new composite score um, for the review process. Um, so maybe you didn't do so well um, the first time around, but you did really well in one section. Then the second time you take the exam, um, either or SAT or ACT, maybe you did better, um, but you bombed one of the sections um, and you did better the first time on that other section. That's why super score is super scoring um, your test scores is helpful because what we'll do is we'll just take the highest from each test that you've taken, the highest score from each um, test, highest score, uh, subscore from each test and create a new composite score for the review. So you might end up having a higher overall score for the exam. We do that at UM. Some schools don't do that. Some schools do. Um, there are some programs that we actually are test optional. So the School of Architecture, um, the School Frost School of Music, those programs are test optional. You don't need to have SAT or ACT scores submitted to be reviewed. Um, and we'll take that into consideration. Um, as far as how important, important it is um, in the admission process, that also depends on the school. At UM, we use a holistic approach when we're reviewing your application. So we're not just looking at test scores. Um, we're not just looking at SAT, um, your GPA. We look at everything because we understand that sometimes you can be an amazing student, but you're maybe not the greatest test taker. Or you can be an amazing student, but you just had a bad day on the day that you went to go take your SAT or ACT. Um, so, in addition to testing, we also look at what you're doing outside of the classroom, the impact that you're making inside and outside the classroom. So your extracurricular mm -hmm. activities, those things are really important, um, at least for us at our institution. Um, we want to see how involved you are, not only in just academics, but also in the community and in whether that's the community at your school, the community at home, or if you're involved in anything 
uh, regionally, nationally, internationally. We look at all of those um, and we consider that as well in the admission process. So again, for us, um, you may have an amazing SAT score and you did nothing in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and we have another student who maybe didn't do so great um, on their testing, but they were involved in everything under the sun and they were committed. They have, they should have proven results of things that they have done and how they have impacted the community. We're going to look more favorably on that student than the other student who did nothing in high school, but just had a lucky day and passed the, the um, SAT, ACT with flying colors. Um, so that goes back again to research. You want to find out how these schools are making their decisions. Um, do they really weigh heavily on the testing or do they not? Do they look at your application in a holistic manner or do they just look at academics and that's it? Um, so that's an important part of the admission process that students and families should consider as well. So where would they find that information? Where can they find it? On the school's website or do they have to do more digging by perhaps contacting the admissions office, speaking to the admissions officer? I mean, where would we find that information? A lot of this information is on the school's website. Like okay. on the University of Miami admissions page, there is a step-by-step -step guide to the admission process. Um, there's an FAQs uh, page there. There's, yeah, like there, there are pages and um, links that students can find all of this information. One important thing that students also should take into consideration is the institution's uh, admitted student profile. That also can be a guide for you on how you should um, navigate your journey in high school. Um, so the admitted student profile is basically um, the profile of what an admitted student looks like at the University of Miami or at any other institution. So for us, on our admitted student profile, we give you the averages of um, test scores that we have admitted this past cycle. We give you the averages of what the GPA looks like. Um, we give you um, the breakdown and demographics of the admitted student population, um, just kind of so students know what they're aiming for. Um, sometimes students will apply to a school that they have 0% chance in getting admitted to. Um, and that's not to, you know, knock them down or anything, but that's because the institution is highly selective and they have told you this is what an admitted student profile looks like. All that information is not secret. It's on their websites. Um, and if it's not on their website, you can ask. You can ask what the admitted student profile looks like. Um, and kind of use that as a guide. Now, it doesn't mean that if you get this GPA and this test score, you're in, like you are in, that's it. Um, at least at UM, that's not how it works. Um, but it is a guide to tell you, okay, you're in the range for being an admissible student. Um, again, it all depends on the profile that year. So we may get lots of students who have the same profile as far as, mm -hmm. um, academics and then that's when we look at the other stuff so extracurricular activities their letters of recommendation um their essay on the common app for us other institutions um not all institutions use the common app but for us we look at the common app your essay that's where all that all of those other components come into play um again all that information but is on the website though can you, can you go back for a little bit? You said sure. uh, at sure. the end, the latter part, you said the essay and right before that, what was the other point you made? Letters of recommendation. Okay. And then I think something else you mentioned before that as well. So you said uh, letters of recommendation, essay, and it was something else. Extracurricular activities? That, yes. <laughs> yes. So, okay. I thought maybe I missed something. Okay. That's good. That's good. Yeah. All right. That's great. Um, so one thing I did want to mention with the uh, GPA. Um, so students should also understand how institutions are looking at their GPA. So at UM, we recalculate students' uh, GPA to an unweighted scale. 
Um, so there's the weighted GPA and then there's the unweighted GPA. The weighted GPA is where is probably the highest. Um, that's where you get all your credits if you're taking AP, dual enrollment, um, ACE, um, IB. Um, that kind of helps your GPA become higher and that's the weighted. Um, and then there's the unweighted. So how we recalculate students' GPA is that we look at their core academic curriculum. So we're not looking at their um, not extracurricular activities. What are those classes called? Um, I just drew a electives. blank. Electives. Electives, yes. Electives. All right. <laughs> We're taking out electives and looking at their core academic courses. Um, and that's how we're, we're calculating their GPA. So there are students who may think, wow, I have a five point, I'm just making something up, a 5.8 GPA. Like I'm getting into every single school I apply to. Um, that's their weighted GPA. But when you look at their unweighted GPA, it may be lower. Um, it is definitely lower, um, but it may not be as high as they think it is. Um, and so that's another thing that students need to keep in mind. Um, some institutions do look at the unweighted GPA or they do, they recalculate students' GPA to an unweighted scale. Um, this is another way to e even the playing field um, as far as the admission process, because we do know that some schools don't offer um, certain classes that can help students, you know, boost their GPA. Some schools maybe only offer a certain number of APs or a certain number of um, dual enrollments, um, a certain number of advanced courses. And so by recalculating the GPA to an unweighted scale um, and looking at students in the context of their school, um, that's one way that the playing field is kind of evened out. Now, not all institutions do that again, um, but that's a question that students and parents want to ask um, if they ever get the chance or opportunity to do so, is how are schools looking at students' as GPAs? Well, that's great. Um, there's a lot of information that you just shared here yeah. tonight, <laughs> and, and that's good. That's very good. As a matter of fact, I, I wanna pause quickly um, to ask all of our participants, all of the attendees, uh, to please submit your questions right now. Uh, submit your questions. I'm sure there's a lot more. There's a lot more that we can cover, but our time is limited. So we want to make sure that we're hitting the high points uh, to help you better position yourself so that you can succeed uh, with the college admissions process. So, so with that, um, as everyone is typing their questions in in the Q&A uh, part of the webinar, um, by the way, for those of you who are unfamiliar with it, it's at the bottom there. You'll see where it says polling, there's Q&A, and more. So you just click on where you see Q&A, and then you can type your questions and submit it, and I'll make sure that we, we answer your questions. All right. So now let, let's talk about um, financial aid. Uh, does financial aid have anything to do with the admissions, the admission process? So um, I keep saying this because it, that's just how it is. It depends on the school. Mm -hmm. um, some schools are need blind. So that means they do not, during the admission process, so the part where they're reading your application and making the decision on whether you should be admitted or not, they do not see what your financial need is. They, whoever, or if it's one person or a committee, usually it's like a committee of people who read the application, um, they won't see what the student's need is, and so they're need blind. Um, there are institutions that do look at that, um, they do look to see what the students, uh, if the student has need um, in their, to make their, their decision process. Um, but at least for UM, we are need blind um, for domestic students. Um, and so when we're reading students' applications, we, we don't know whether or not they're applying for financial aid or not. I see. I see. So we have a question that just came in. By the way, um, everyone who's here, submit your questions now. Uh, we're going to go right into the Q&A session of this uh, part of the webinar. Uh, you can click again on the Q&A uh, portion on the bottom there and submit your questions. 
All right. So the first question comes from Richard. And the question is, I want to double major at UM at the Frost School of Music, music education and music therapy. How would my credits work? Um, so at UM, it is definitely possible to double major. Um, we actually encourage students to do so. It's very rare to find a UM student who is not double majoring or who doesn't have a minor. Um, and the reason this is possible is because of our Cognates program. Um, and so Cognates is basically our version of general education. Um, and this is another you know, important question that students should find out is how does the general education um, component of their curriculum work? Um, at UM, we don't tell students what classes they need to take for their gen eds. It's up to them to decide how they want to do it. Um, basically, there are three areas of knowledge. There's arts and humanities, people in society, and STEM. Um, and you have to take three classes under each of those areas. What those classes are, though, are completely up to you. So you get to decide how you want to craft that experience. Um, and so that's why students end up getting the second major, because um, they're already taking classes in that area. So just add a few more and there's their second major or it becomes a minor. Um, so it is possible to double major in the Frost School or any of the schools and colleges that we have. Um, you just work with your academic advisor so they can make sure you're do taking the right credits. That's awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you for asking that question, Richard. And we have another question that came in uh, from anonymous anonymous uh, attendee. It says, for students in underserved, one moment, for students in underserved schools where rigorous courses are not offered, how are they viewed by the admissions office? Um, that's a really great question. Um, and so like I mentioned, um, at least at the University of Miami, we look at students in the context of their school. So we are aware of what the school's profile looks like because that's one of the components, um, at least for us, in our application process. You're, the school has to send in a school profile. And basically the school profile tells us what kind of classes are offered at that school, the rigor of the curriculum at that school. And then whoever's reading that application will then use that to base their um, recommendation on. Um, so if the school only offers two APs, um, and the student only took one, that is still the student showing that they challenge themselves. If the school offers 50 APs and the student took one, then that's a different story, right? Um, so we look at um, the different uh, schools and, and the rigor of the curriculum that they each offer, and we make our recommendations based on that school. So again, we're not comparing students to other students at other schools that may have more opportunities to take more advanced courses. We look at them within the context of their school. Great question. Hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> Great question. All right. Hold on. Okay, so we have another question that came in. It, it says, uh, if I live far away from my current high school and I can't participate in too many clubs, for example, max three to four, how would that affect my admission? That's a great question. Um, and that goes back to context. So you want to make sure that you are telling us everything that you want us to know about you in the admission process. Um, and so if that's the case for you, you want to make sure you find somewhere on the application to indicate that. So whether that's in your essay or um, if you're using the common application to apply to multiple schools, there is a section on there um, labeled additional comments. If that's something that you feel is important for us to know, um, you, you can tell us. Um, again, we're not, we don't know who you are, um, really, unless you tell us. And so having as much context as possible will help inform our decisions, um, at least, again, at the University of Miami, because we look at your applications holistically. Also, whoever's writing your letters of recommendation, if you feel that, if that that's something important that they, should, that they should write or that you want us to know, tell them to put that in the letter of recommendation, that so-and-so is a great student, blah, blah, blah 
and they live super far away from school, which is why they're not involved in as many organizations as possible, but this is what they're doing in their time. Um, and one thing I wanted to mention with that, um, with extracurricular activities, that looks like a variety of things. Extracurricular activities doesn't necessarily just have to be being part of an organization or doing sports. You can have a full-time job after school, and that's an extracurricular activity or, is, or a part-time job. Maybe all you do after school is go home to babysit your siblings because your parents have to go to work. That is an extracurricular activity. Um, so you want to make sure that you put that information on the application as well so that we know. And you can do that on the Common App um, if that's what you're using to apply to schools um, in the extracurricular activities section. Um, there's about 10 slots that you can put information um, for your extracurricular activities. Use one of those slots and explain that. Um, that again provides context for us who you know who are reading your application so we kind of know what student you are outside of the classroom as well great question oh yes and what if someone's involved uh, in their church right um, can we add that to the application as well yes <laughs> definitely okay. being involved in the community whether that's at church um, mm -hmm. or maybe you're doing something else, that's important. You can definitely put that on the application. Um, you want to be specific. So if you're doing something at church or whatever organization or club or sports that you're part of, be specific. Tell us what you're doing. If you have a leadership role, um, maybe you've done, I'm going to use a church example since um, that's what you mentioned. Maybe you're the Bible school teacher for the young children at your church. Um, and you've been doing that for five years. Be specific. Put that information on there. Um, maybe you've won an award through the um, activity that you've done. You want to make sure that you're telling us. Don't just tell us, um, I go to church. That's it. <laughs> and come to find out, you're the one who, you're the volunteer coordinator, coordinating um, different activities for people to get involved with in the community. That's important. So you want to make sure you're very specific as well when you're writing your letters. I'm, I'm sorry, when you're writing your extracurricular activities. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we have uh, one more question that came in uh, from, uh, this is from Diego. It, he said, uh, does early admission affect your chances of getting into college? And how should I decide whether or not to do early admission? That is a great, great question. question. These are all great questions. Um, so again, going back to what I've been saying, do your research because it depends. Some schools offer early admission options. And so at the University of Miami, we offer early action and early decision. There, these have distinct differences. So that's where the research comes in. You wanna make sure you understand what those differences are. Early decision is a binding contract. That means that you have signed a contract, and you actually do sign a contract um, if you do early decision, saying that if you get admitted to the institution, you are coming, regardless of what the financial aid package looks like. Early action is non-binding. So you're still applying early. You'll still find out early whether you got in or not, but it's non-binding. So there's no contract, no strings attached. You don't have to come even if you get in. Early decision, depending on the school that you're applying to, um, they'll tell you, you know, some students who apply early decision are looked um, upon more favorably um, because of they've agreed that if they get in, they're coming and that's it. Um, early action is also looked upon favorably because that shows that the student is, this is one of the student's top choice. They've done their research. They have got, they've done everything that they, needed to do to submit their application early. And so that shows that they are really interested in coming. Um, I tell students that if finances are not a deal for you, like you got it like that is how I say it. And you know, 100% that you want to go to that institution, do early decision. Mm -hmm. If you are waiting on a financial aid package, that's what you're waiting on to make your decision on whether you're coming to an institution or not do not do early decision because again, it's based on, um, it's a, a binding contract. So you have agreed to come regardless of what financial aid looks like. Um, 
there was something else I was going to mention about early decision, but it slips my mind. So if it comes back, I'll, <laughs> sorry. That's all right. That's great. That, that is great. So, wow. Great questions tonight. Great information. Thank you so much for uh, the wonderful information that you shared with us tonight. Now, as we come to a close, by the way, guys, if you have any questions, final questions, try to get them in right now. Uh, so as, as we come to a close, uh, Gertiana, if you would, let's go, let's go way back, right? Um, what would you say to yourself, uh, your, let's say your 15-year-old self? 15, let's say, yeah, 15 is good. 15 is a good number. Good age. Uh. <laughs> what, would you say to, what would you say to your 15-year-old self about uh, college and what would you do differently knowing what you know today? Well, you don't have to go into all the specifics, but as far as the mm -hmm. generalities, um, what would you say to yourself? What advice would you give? Because I, I know we have a lot of students here. And, and also, what, what, do you, what do you think you would do differently knowing what you now know? Um, do you mean as far as the admission process or just college in general? College in general, as well as the admissions process. Um, definitely one of the things I would have done differently, and this is again, because I didn't even know, um, would have been to reach out to admission officers at schools that I was interested in. Um, UM was my top choice. Um, and so I wasn't really interested in any other schools. Um, but even UM, I would have definitely, um, if I would have known, um, I would have attended information sessions and talk to admission officers um, to kind of help me figure out my game plan. Um, that's, I think, a hidden resource that students don't know they can do. Um, and it always baffles me. I, I don't know if baffles the word. It always surprises me when I get um, an email or a student reaches out to me who, like in ninth grade is like, hi, I'm really interested in this school. And I'm like, you just started high school. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you telling me? Um, but that student is showing that they're interested and they're on top of their game as far as trying to learn as much as they can so that they can navigate high school to get to where they need to go. Um, as far as being in college, one thing that I would have done differently um, was maybe take more advantage of the opportunities offered um, at the institution at UM. I went to UM. Um, there's a lot of opportunities available for students, whether that's doing research, um, doing study abroad. That's one thing I didn't do in undergrad, which is one of my biggest regrets. Um, I should have started the process earlier. I did try to go to study abroad, but I started too late, and so it didn't work out. Um, but that, those, that I would definitely have done differently, would start early um, in getting involved in the opportunities available to me. That's great. And, and it, you know, when I, when I think about that question for myself, there's a whole lot of things I, <laughs> I, I can think of because we didn't have this, right? We, we didn't no. have this uh, when I was in school, you know? <laughs> so I, I really wish if there was a way, if there's like a time machine or so, of some sort, <laughs> we can get in and we just go back and redo a lot of things. But, but I think it's a good thing now, right? For, for yeah. all of the students who are, who are locked in, who are here, uh, who are focused, who, have, who are laser focused, because you guys are still here. That's, that's amazing. That's great. And great questions. Uh, Diego, Diego has a, another question here. Um, the question is, what does the ideal student look like to the admissions office? Um, well, I, I'm guessing he means at the University of Miami um, or just in general. Well, Let's let's take it from the admissions office in University of Miami and then okay. uh, yeah. open it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the ideal student, um, we are looking for change makers. So that goes back to the holistic review when it comes to the admission process. Um, we want to see the impact that you're making not only in the classroom, but also outside of the classroom. Um, we look at students who can fit into the environment at the university because a lot of our students are doing a lot of work 
inside and outside of the classroom. Um, they're using the skills that they're learning um, to make a difference around them. And so one thing that you will notice if you ever come and visit our campus is that our students are active. There's always something going on. There's always um, an organization that's recruiting students to volunteer out in the community. There's always something going on campus to raise awareness about certain issues. And so that's the ideal student um, in addition to the profile. As far as like the academic profile, um, it's slipping my mind, but I believe the averages last year, um, the average unweighted GPA for an, admit, an admitted student was a 3.8. Um, the averages for testing um, was between a 1320 and a 1380 and a 1420 for SAT and a 31 and 32 for ACT. Um, those are averages though, and that's why I didn't really kind of start with that because that's just one part of the holistic student, right? Um, the averages don't mean you need exactly those scores to get in or that GPA to get in. That's just based on all of the students who got admitted last year, that was the average um, testing range and GPA for that population. So yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Great question, great question. Now, as, as we come to a close, um, Gertiana, I, I want you to, if you could, speak to the educators for a moment. What can educators do, um, high school educators, middle school educators, what can they do, and even elementary educators, what can they do to, to help their students have a clear path, or I don't know if they can have a clear path, but uh, just not that many obstacles and hindrances along the way uh, to, to finding the right college and just being in a better position when they're in their senior year. What is it that an educator can do to prepare their students? I think one of the biggest things is exposure, um, especially um, in air, uh, schools where they don't have that many um, counselors, uh, to assist all of the students, or they don't have that many resources to take students on field trips and things like that. I think exposing students to the idea of going to college is number one. Um, so a lot of ed educators, I am assuming, did go to college to be able to educate or become an educator for these students. And so even just talking about your own experience with these students, showing them pictures, wearing your, um, your school's um, a t-shirt, for uh, a spirit day. You know, those are the small things that we don't really think about um, that have an impact, but they really do. Um, students um, begin to become curious about like college and students um, going off into studying. So I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, another thing uh, that educators can do um, is I would say just kind of pointing students to different resources available online. The internet, again, I mentioned that earlier, is a huge gift in this, you know, particular conversation that we're having because a lot of the information is available online. So if students have questions that educators may not know the answers to, it's right there. It's just a quick Google search going on that institution's website to find out um, what the student is looking for. It's right there. Um, so I think that's another important thing that educators can do. And then finally, it's just the words that you speak to students, I think is helpful. Um, a lot of times students may not have that uh, encouraging and motivating um, person in their corner, maybe at home, but they find it at school. And that's really important. Um, encouraging and motivating students to go beyond, um, you know, right after high school is something that students really need to hear. W whatever that may be, and then for this conversation, we're talking about college, encouraging, motivating students that they can go to college, um, they can pursue higher education, it is possible. Um, there are different opportunities available. They're not limited by the, their zip code or by the resources available in their home. Um, there are opportunities for them to soar high and to go beyond. So I think that's the last thing that educators should keep in mind. Great. Awesome. There's one last question before we close, and that is sure. community college. Mm -hmm. 
a lot of students say, no, I'm not going there. I don't want to go there. It's it, this, you know, whatever, whatever their opinions are, uh, they say, well, I don't want to go there. I don't want to. So what, what's your take on that? I mean, someone who's unable to get into UM or let's say FIU or any other uh, four year or, or more um, university, what, what if community, community college is the only way or maybe the best option for them? That's fine. Um, if you've done your research, you've looked at all the options and, and realized that that is the best option for you, that is completely fine. If you want to, um, there are many routes you can go down when you go to community college. You can go for two years um, and then, you know, build yourself up. Maybe you didn't do so well in high school, but in community college, you're, you're more focused. You know exactly what you want to do. Um, you build yourself up and then you apply as a transfer student to these schools. I know yeah. plenty of students who apply as transfer students to the University of Miami. Actually, the transfer app, the transfer process is actually much more simpler um, for students applying at the University of Miami. Um, and we tell students that. So if you didn't do so great, you know, don't beat yourself up about it. Again, like I said, there are plenty of options out there. So community colleges is one of them. Um, I will just briefly kind of explain. So at UM, if you have more than 30 college credits, you can apply as a transfer student. So maybe in high school you didn't do so well, but you do have a few dual, dual enrollment credits, you know, around, laying around. Take a few more classes, one, go to community college. It doesn't have to be a full two years. Sometimes you can just take a full academic year and then transfer. Um, we look at students, um, if you have more than 30 college credits, we won't even look at your high school stuff. So we won't even look at your high school GPA. We won't even ask for testing um, from high school. We'll only look at the things that you've done at the community college and any other college credits that you were able to acquire. Um, so it is definitely possible to transfer. Um, also, there are community colleges that have full four-year programs. So if that's the best option for you, um, especially when you're thinking about finances, um, you can do that as well. Um, when it comes to finances, there are schools that will help and assist um, transfer students um, to get full scholarships, to get um, full, um, to meet their full need. Um, so don't limit yourself, but if you feel like you want to continue on at a community college and stay there and complete a full four-year program, that is a possibility too. UM actually has an agreement with Miami-Dade um, right now where we are, um, uh, I can't remember the name. I'm sorry. I've been quarantined too long. So my brain <laughs> is <laughs> forgetting words, but we do have an agreement with Miami Dade college with, for transfer students. Um, so if you meet a certain, uh, criteria, you can get scholarships. Um, so those are the other things that you also want to look at when you're doing research but going to community college is completely fine if that's the option that you think is best for you don't feel bad about it it's absolutely okay to do well that's great that that's very good so which means there are, there are no excuses and i think no um from tonight's webinar yes, thank you Marissa. Right? articulation agreement <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> so there are no excuses whatsoever, which means, look, guys, you can do this. Um, you can take go the community college route, or if if you're if you're able to right now, you can also look at the other options. So uh, the point is, college is one of the best options for a lot of students. In fact, it, it creates more opportunities. You have more opportunities, more windows of opportunities, yeah. because the more knowledge you have. Uh, the better, better prepared you will be. And there's also the college experience, right? right? You get to network. And I think, I think the college experience itself, that piece, that part of it, uh, someone said, well, I can get the same information from a book, right? I can go to Barnes and Noble right. or I can go to Amazon, but you're not going to, you're not going to get the college experience. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get 
linked up to this network of people who are perhaps going in the same direction as you as far as their, ma their major. And you don't know who that person's going to become later on. So, I mean, right. it, it, there's a wealth of, of, of um, opportunities, if you will, information, knowledge, and so on, and experiences that you will gain when you go to college. So thank you again for coming tonight this morning or whenever you're watching this recording, <laughs> right? So uh, we, we will put the replay online. I, I have to do that because I think a lot of people, I'm, I know for a fact that many people will receive a ton of value from it. And, and let me just pause for a quick second. Those of you who are still here with us, let me know in the chat right now, did you get some value from tonight's webinar? Let me know in the chat, did you get some value? Go ahead. Let me know. All right. Emily said, yeah. Maritza <laughs> said, gems. Michelle said, yes. All right. With like three S's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's awesome. That's great. That's great. So now I'm sure many people are asking, how can we reach you? Like if we wanted to talk to you, um, do you give out your number? <laughs> like, do you give out I your number? I don't give out my personal number. No. <laughs> But you can look me up. I am on the university's um, website. Meet the staff. You'll see my beautiful face. Um, you can always email me. My email is g.thelomar at umiami.edu. That's also on the website. Um, and my office phone number is also available. Um, do not hesitate to reach out. I am always happy to assist students whether it is going to um or just the, just questions about the college admission process in general i am available to help awesome thank you again for coming uh, ethan said excellent info great um anaya said yes thank you very much uh michelle said i learned a lot many things i wish i knew when i was younger Awesome. And, and on that point, by the way, for those of us who are older, right, for those of us who may feel like we've missed the boat, uh, is, is this, does this still apply to older students who are Definitely. planning or who want to go back to college? Oh, yeah. This applies to students who are interested in going to graduate school, yeah. students who want to go back um, and finish a degree that they never got a chance to finish. If they want to transfer, maybe they're still out of school, but they you know, are looking to go elsewhere and to get a fresh start. This all applies. You know, doing your research is key. Um, there's a lot of opportunities available out there for anyone. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely applicable to anyone at any stage of, in life. That's awesome. That is awesome. Thank you again for coming on. And we're going to close out. Thank you for having out. me. <laughs> Thank you. And we're going to close out right here, guys. Uh, by the way, I will post this on the YouTube channel so if you are not subscribed if you haven't subscribed yet do so today i'm going to post this and we have a podcast that's coming out very soon it's directed to educators but i would love for you guys to come and, and subscribe to the podcast as well because a lot of the information that we're sharing with educators are also applicable to you as students as parents as mentors that you can then also you know, use and apply to your life. So I'm really thrilled again for tonight. It was amazing. It was incredible. Thank you again, Gertie Anna. <laughs>